Okay, I promised you Wade Davis. This is Wade's second appearance. He will be here one more time later in the day. Uh, but in this appearance, he presents himself and his work in the way that I think most people know him, which is as an explorer. Explorer in residence at National Geographic for many, many years, and a prolific writer of what it is that he sees and experiences. Um, I had a little glancing contact with Colombia. Uh, I, I built a television station there in Bogota on behalf of partners there who uh, are still running the station that still exists. John, do you have that little video? Recognize the style? Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't delve deeply into the history of the country, uh, but it's a deceptive place. Uh, I think I got this right, Wade, about 40, 40 plus million people. And Bogota, 48 now. And, uh, and Bogota itself, a city of some 7 million. So this is something substantial that we're not that familiar with. And the one other little wrinkle that I sussed out while I was there um, is that uh, in South America, the Brazilians tend to go to universities. I'm talking about the elite. Uh, they go to universities in the United States. And the Colombians, I discovered, uh, favor Canada. Uh, my own experience there with the people who had both found us and engaged us and became our partners there um, was outstanding. Uh, from a standing start, a handshake, eight months later, a television station on the air, which is still alive. So, um, I bring you a honorary citizen of Colombia, Wade Davis, to tell you about his latest discovery. Thank you, thank you, Moses. Well, thank you very much, Moses. You know, I think, um, as travelers, we fall in love with the first country that captures our heart and gives us license to be free. And for me, of course, it was Colombia. The rugged knot of mountains, the Macizo Colombiano, which is the birthplace of the nation where the three great arms of the Cordillera run away to the Caribbean coastal plain, where you encounter in the lower reaches of the Rio Magdalena, the Mississippi of Colombia, wetlands as wide as the sky, the mysterious paramos that exist in few other places in the world, and of course the limitless expanse, the sea of forests that is the Amazon and Colombia itself the size of the country of France. Well, this love affair, this strange love affair between a boy and a people and a, and a nation began innocently enough in 1968 when my mother, a modest but determined Canadian woman told me that Spanish was a language of the future. And she worked as a secretary all year to save money to allow me to join a small group of schoolboys being taken by a teacher to Cali, Colombia. And at 14, I was the youngest of the group and the most fortunate because unlike the others who spent a season in the sweltering streets of the city, I was billeted with a family high up in the mountains along the edge of trails that reached west to the Pacific. And it was a classic Colombian scene, an indulgent father, too many children to keep track of, an old grandmother who muttered to herself on a porch overlooking fruit trees and flower gardens, an angelic sister who more than once carried her brother and me home half drunk to a mother kind beyond words who stood at the garden gate, hands on hips, tapping the stone steps, feigning anger as she welcomed us back into the family. For Eight weeks, I kind of encountered the 
intensity and passion of a people with this extraordinary warmth and a kind of appreciation for the frailty of the human spirit. Many of the older Canadian lads became what the Colombians call suffering from mamitis. They became homesick, where I, by contrast, felt that I had finally found home. And six years later, I returned to, to, to Colombia. And coming of age in Colombia, living where my uh, hat fell, I was never afraid. The, the, the warmth of the people enveloped me like a protective cloak, uh, tailor-made for wonder. And at the time, I believed that bliss was an objective state that you could achieve by simply opening yourself to the world. And so, both literally and metaphorically, I drank from every stream, even tire tracks in the road. And of course, naturally, I was constantly sick. <laughs> Malaria and dysentery fevers that ran through the night and broke mercifully in the dawn. But even that seemed part of the, the process. At one point, on a day's notice, I accepted a engagement to walk across 250 miles of rainforest of the Darien Gap with a crazy British journalist when finally we emerged from the forest having spent 14 days lost with no food, no shelter in the rainy season. I found myself on a small airplane flying to Panama City. The girl beside me puked all over me. Her mother turned back to console the daughter. She puked on me as well. <laughs> I got off the plane in Panama City with three dollars to my name, uh, the rags on my back, and I never felt more alive. Well, Colombia has gone through a great deal. And of course, I fell into the orbit of this extraordinary botanical explorer, Richard Evan Schultes. And when it came time to write his autobiography, his biography, naturally the book became, in a sense, a love letter to a country that by then had become a pariah in the world. In 2002, Colombia was literally a failed state. Who could have known that this beautiful plant, known to the Inca as a divine leaf of immortality, a plant that in 4,000 years had not had any evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, would spark a fratricidal war of such horrific extent? At the height of the Medellin cartel, Escobar was putting 80 tons of cocaine into North America every month. The wealth was such that they measured it in bay, hails of bay, bay, hail, uh, hay bales that they had to package up and weigh. In fact, the Medellin cartel at its height budgeted every week $1,000 just to buy elastic bands. And even though Escobar owned 800 properties, even that wasn't enough to stash the cash. And it was precisely this fratricidal warfare that afflicted the Colombian people, most of whom, of course, have never seen, let alone use cocaine. And yet over the last 50 years, this bloody war has resulted in 220,000 dead. For one terrible period of time, in 1996 to 2000, every three hours of the day and night, somebody was kidnapped. 30,000 victims, most of whom never returned. In the end, five million Colombians were forced to flee their nation, either by choice or largely by necessity. Within the country, 7.2 million people became internally displaced. Now, just think about it. How would the United States feel about its war on drugs if we in Canada had policies and patterns of consumption that resulted in 85 million Americans being driven from their homes? Well, this is precisely what happened in Colombia, a war that lasted 50 years, but a war that was not the choosing of the Colombian people. In a nation of 48 million people, the total combatants on all three sides never numbered more than 200,000. And so the Colombian people were victims of a war that was fueled exclusively by our consumption of cocaine. So if you want to know who has blood on their hands, it's every individual you have ever met who has used illicit cocaine and every government that has facilitated that trade without doing anything to actually stop the circulation of the drug. And so, in the wake of this horrible series of violence, Colombia, at last, finds itself on the edge of peace. The world may be falling apart, but Colombia 
is falling together. Within the country, people are on the move. Thousands and millions of people discovering their home for the first time. And Colombia, most assuredly, is not a country of violence and drugs. Indeed, it's a country of, as I write in a new book, of colores y cariño, where the people have been able to endure this nightmare precisely because of their character, a character that is firmly rooted in a spirit of place and a love of a land that is ecologically and biologically the richest nation on earth, home to 10% of global biodiversity, the kind of place that I, as a young botanical explorer, could simply spin the compass to discover new species of plants that had never been documented by science. And so as Colombia emerges from its nightmare, it is discovering this extraordinary um, set of possibilities. Within the country itself, individuals are on the move. Internationally, two generations of Colombians forced to flee are returning from every city in the world with skill sets in every conceivable endeavor, setting in motion the potential for an economic, social, cultural renaissance unlike anything that has ever been seen in Latin America. And they were also discovering that the great benefit of the war, if there was any benefit at all, is the fact that for 50 years, many regions of the country were simply off limits to modern development. And so, for example, in a half century in which nations like Ecuador literally sacrificed its Oriente to oil exploration, colonization, deforestation, Colombia remains pristine. The Amazon, again, the size of France, is roadless and untouched. And so Colombians who now long for peace are also finding themselves in a situation where they are making choices about the future of their country informed by 50 years of science, information and data that simply wasn't available to us years ago when Colombia sacrificed its landscape to development. And so Colombia is on the threshold of a great breakthrough. Peace will be hard. War is easy, peace is difficult. Violence will flare. There's a tremendous amount of pressure being brought to bear on areas of the land that have been isolated for so long. Cocaine production is in fact soaring because until the nation states have the courage to invoke the cleansing gesture of legalization, cocaine will always remain corrosive in the Colombian reality. But the most important thing for all of us to remember is that we all share a certain responsibility for, for the fate of a nation that despite all these problems, 50 year, years of war, 220,000 dead, has nevertheless managed to maintain civil society and democracy, green its cities, uh, create millions of acres of national parks, and seek proper restitution with its indigenous people in a manner more progressive than any other nation state on earth. So Colombia is on the brink of a new dawn. And the way to think about Colombia perhaps most powerfully is to remember that when we celebrate magical realism as Colombia's gift to Latin American literature, you must understand that magical realism within Colombia is simply journalism. Gabo was a journalist. Garcia Marquez wrote as he did simply because he was a journalist who happened to live in a land where heaven and earth converge on a regular basis to reveal glimpses of the divine. And as Andres said in the morning, everything hangs in the balance. I was with Mamo Camillo when he first said to me, peace won't matter if it's only an excuse for the three sides to come together to maintain a war against nature. I shared those thoughts with President Santos, who then tweeted it out to the nation. And the heart of Colombia is music. Of the 100 more most popular YouTubes on the internet, 85 are music videos, 10 of those are Colombian. And Cumbia is the heartbeat of Colombia, but the mother of the heartbeat is the Magdalena River, which flows the length of the 
country south to north. It is to Colombia what the Mississippi is to the United States, a conduit of commerce, but an avenue of culture, of poetry, and prayer. And the heart of Colombia is music. It is said to be the land of a thousand rhythms. Actually, ethnomusicologists have identified 1,025. And, and cumbia is the heart. And what you heard this morning, and I, I was a very nervous father. Um, <laughs> I never, you know how much I speak publicly. I could go and speak in front of 5,000 people without a, a thought. But to have my daughter um, coming on stage with the band, uh, last time I saw them, she, they were playing with Carlos Vivas in front of 12,000 people. So it's rather nice to be able to have a more modest audience. But I actually thought that I was going to be coming before them. So I was going to set them up for you by just telling you something about this rhythm that is indeed the heartbeat of Colombia. And let me just close um, by telling you something about cumbia. This comes from my new book, Magdalena, which is a story of Colombia. It's, it's it's, it, if one river was a love letter to the country, a map of dreams to the country. The new book, Magdalena, coming out next spring is truly a love letter to the nation. Because cumbia is a rhythm, a beat, a dance, a choreography of seduction that ignites the spirit and shakes the soul, infusing one's entire physical being with a sensual promise as innocent and perfect as a prayer. It is a universal muse that, like a spirit being, reaches out to all as the ultimate weapon of love. It is not the artist that sings the song, it is the spirit of the song that sings the artist. The stage is a temple. Music serves as prayer. Dancers spin into trance. The audience, as congregation, rocks to the rhythms of devotion not for the artist, but for the art. Songs that touch the far reaches of the soul, the most passionate depths of emotion. Even while grounding the spirit in the soil of a nation, leaving everyone not damp with sweat, but moistened by the purity of the rains, the promise of the rivers, drenched in all the possibilities of a new day. Thanks very much.